From now, the present Antarctic Treaty comes up for review, and with it, the future of the world's seventh and least populous continent. For almost 30 years, the treaty has set aside competing claims to ownership in favor of science, peace, and international cooperation. All 25 nations with bases in Antarctica say they remain committed to these ideals. But tonight's dispatch reveals how under the cloak of scientific activity, those nations are up to something very different. At stake, a chance to exploit Antarctica's strategic and economic potential for national gain. On a continent owned by nobody, but claimed by almost everyone, what are they really playing at in this game on the ice? At 86 degrees south, Rear Admiral Luther Schriefer of the United States Navy is en route to the remotest point touched by his command. The South Pole, the place Captain Scott died to reach 78 years ago, is today the jewel in the crown of the American presence in Antarctica. This spot has been continuously occupied by the United States since 1956. But apart from providing the ultimate photo opportunity for visiting VIPs, why exactly has the United States invested hundreds of millions of dollars here? Why indeed is the US in Antarctica at all? 1,500 miles away, the Soviet base at Molodezhnaya. Today is October Revolution Day, and station commander Yuri Khabarov leads a parade to celebrate Lenin's seizure of power in 1917. There are 450 men here, yet it's only one of eight Soviet bases in Antarctica. So why are the Russians here? Why indeed are any of the 25 nations with bases in Antarctica here? question for delegates to last October's Antarctic Conference in Paris. Our purpose is to promote scientific research. We've obviously got an interest in science, an environmental interest, and our interest is also in international cooperation. The fundamental aspect of our presence is scientific research. No, I have here, 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 that this continent is peace, peace and international cooperation. In confirmation of the Antarctic Treaty, in other words, only science, science, and science. Science, peace, and international cooperation, the central ideals of the Antarctic Treaty, are the recurring themes. But are they the real reasons? On the frozen sea near the main American base at McMurdo, a team of scientists from the University of Alabama is preparing to study how sponges on the sea floor protect themselves from predators. A hundred miles inland, a helicopter is resupplying a field camp, one of many set up each summer as part of the United States Antarctic program. Here, biologists are studying life in a lake permanently covered by 10 feet of ice. The American program is run by the National Science Foundation, a government agency. With state-of-the-art technology, the level of spending is impressive. The American commitment to science seems beyond question. Well, we're the National Science Foundation, and, and uh, science is our middle name. So from our standpoint, from the National Science Foundation standpoint, that's the only reason we're in Antarctica. Um, the presidential memorandum 
says the United States will have a presence in Antarctica, and that presence is to be executed through science. So that's our job, and that's what we do. I, I say that's, that's just an absolute uh, distortion of fact. I just don't, I just don't think the, uh, if you were to make an, an open evaluation of it, that, that it would equate that way. Otherwise, there would be, if, if so, somebody should be fired because there isn't that much science being developed out of the, out of the so-called science buck that's being spent in Antarctica. During eight seasons in Antarctica, Professor Al Erickson, one of the world's leading mammologists, has been able to observe American spending priorities at first hand. The budget of the United States Antarctic program is $150 million a year, but less than a third of that is directly related to science. The rest goes on a massive logistical operation centered on the US base at McMurdo, Antarctica's first city. Uh, the perception that is sold to at least our American public is that the reason we're in Antarctica is for science. And in fact, uh, I think that's a scam. I think we have far other uh, considerations in mind than science. Otherwise, if it were science, we would get about doing science, and, uh, and the productivity of that science would be far greater than it is. But at least the Americans do send real scientists to do real scientific research in Antarctica. Whether the same can be said of the Russians is open to question. Pride of Place, among the Soviet scientific effort, is an atmospheric program which uses rockets to probe conditions 50 miles above the Earth's surface. Yes. Four, three, two, one, A rocket is launched at precisely seven minutes past five each Wednesday. In fact, it's been the same every Wednesday for the past 22 years. Almost everything in the research program at Molodezhnaya has the same routine quality. Twice an hour, every hour of the day, Every day of the year for the past 17 years, this machine has sent out radio signals to be picked up by other Russian stations in Antarctica and beyond. It goes under the name of geophysical research, but the men minding the machines are technicians and engineers, not scientists. And the program seems to have more to do with maintaining good radio communications than with Antarctic discovery. Of the 450 men at Molodezhnaya, only one leaves the base each day to investigate the continent beyond. N. Kaup is an Estonian biologist specializing in the ecology of lakes. During the many hours he spent drilling and taking samples, he's had time to reflect on the kind of science carried out at the base. There is too, uh, too much routine work done, and these opportunities here could be used better to make uh, more uh, science uh, searching type. The absence of pioneering work not only makes killing time a way of life, it's led N. Kaup to question the real purpose of the Soviet Antarctic program. The main aim of the Soviet Union and many other nations need to be present in Antarctica. And once uh, you are present, you should be engaged with something. And here, the science may be seen the most good thing to be engaged with. But uh, I think for the many nations, here the presence is of the first priority. Antarctica makes up one-tenth of the land area of the world. If further evidence is needed that presence is more important than science, it's to be found 3,000 miles away from Molodezhnaya on an island no larger than Greater London. King George Island has only a few square miles of ice-free land, but the Soviet Union, Chile, China, Uruguay, South Korea, Argentina, Poland, Brazil and Ecuador 
have all established a presence here. So acute is the crowding that the Russian base is only 200 yards from the Chileans. When the South Koreans arrived four years ago, they built their base on a patch of land the Spanish had been hoping to use. And Ecuador's presence, in fact nothing more than a ship's container, pipped the Peruvians to the post on another part of the island. All these countries claim they're doing useful science. But Charles Swithinbank, widely regarded as the world's most experienced Antarctic scientist, takes a different view. It's absurd. Uh, there's no other word for it, because there's no special scientific interest there, and uh, the most interesting scientists have been long since worked out on that island, and uh, real scientists have moved uh, further south. It's the only place you can get to without an ice-strengthened ship, so you can maintain a symbolic presence there at very little cost, and that is what they are doing. The second great Antarctic ideal is a commitment to the peaceful use of the continent. But the Antarctic Treaty is vague about precisely what this means, and it specifically permits the use of military personnel for peaceful purposes. Navy Broadcasting Service Detachment McMurdo now presents the MacTown Evening News. The United States, for one, makes full use of this provision. Almost half the summer population of 1,000 at McMurdo is military. Good evening and welcome to the latest edition of the MacTown Evening News. The stated purpose of the military is the provision of logistical support. Some observers see this kind of military involvement as unnecessary and potentially dangerous. But the reasons for it are rooted in history. December 2nd, 1946. Task Force 68 the largest polar expedition ever to put to sea, left the United States for Antarctica. A key purpose of Operation High Jump was to explore and map Antarctica, though the armed forces also saw it as a training ground for polar warfare. LBTs were tested on the ice and in the water. The naval interest established during Operation High Jump has never been relinquished. Today, Christchurch in New Zealand is the main staging post for the support force, which goes under the name of Operation Deep Freeze. In the southern summer, Hercules aircraft operated both by the US Navy and by the Royal New Zealand Air Force fly a continuous shuttle south to McMurdo Station. With thousands of tons to be shipped each season, star-lifted jets from the United States Air Force also fly missions to McMurdo. American-born campaigner Bob Leonard has made a detailed study of U.S. activities. Well, one of the great ironies, uh, and I believe a tragic flaw in the Antarctic Treaty, is the provision for military logistics. It's a natural uh, progression from the history of various nations' involvement on the ice, particularly the United States. Uh, the military was there essentially first. The progression then has been toward uh, a degree of demilitarization, but nevertheless, when you start with a military entrenched, essentially right from the beginning, it's very hard to get rid of it. And indeed, it's written into the Antarctic Treaty. This squadron of ski-equipped Hercules provides a clear indication that the military have only partially disengaged. Formerly owned by the Navy, the aircraft were officially transferred to the National Science Foundation in the early 1970s but they're still operated by Navy crews and only one small stencil near the passenger door identifies their civilian ownership. The ski-equipped Hercules give America the capability of landing virtually anywhere in Antarctica. So what are the orders of the commander of the US Naval Support Force, Captain Joe Mazza? I have no orders at all uh, regarding any military uh, missions or, or goals in Antarctica. My orders are 
uh, to support the National Science Foundation, and that's, that's precisely what we do. If there is any um, weight given to our, our presence or any uh, increase in influence that we have because the aircraft uh, are military and because the support force is military, it's purely uh, incidental to our scientific support. Whether or not the U.S. Navy has any continuing military interest in Antarctica, it has been involved in scientific research with potential military applications. One such experiment was located here at Seifel Station. Built in 1969, Seifel became the location for one of the longest radio aerials in the world. Originally 13 miles long, it was subsequently doubled to 26 miles. Its purpose was to investigate very low frequency, or VLF, radio waves, including ultra-low frequencies never before artificially generated outside a nuclear explosion. The location of Seifel was critical. The experiment involved sending VLF signals into space to see whether they would interact with the Earth's magnetic field to produce ultra-low frequency waves. If so, these would be detectable in the Northern Hemisphere at a receiving station at Roberval in Canada. In virtually all other respects, the location of Seifel was far from ideal. For one thing, it was 1,500 miles from McMurdo. Everything had to be brought in by air in a round-trip journey of more than 10 hours. A second problem was the continual build-up of snow. It took constant maintenance to keep the 26 miles of aerial above the surface, free of snow and ice. Buildings also became buried. After 10 years, an entirely new station had to be built after the original began to cave in under 40 feet of accumulated ice. All this demanded an exceptional level of commitment. So why was it such a priority? Bob Leonard. The fact of the matter is that the Navy is interested in developing submarine communications. Now, it's widely known uh, that very low frequency communication is used to, to communicate with submerged nuclear submarines. That depth at which that's effective is only about 50 feet, about 15 or 20 meters. The research at Seifel has been directed at finding communication at even lower frequencies, the so-called ultra-low frequency, which would allow communications to depths of about a thousand feet, or say 300 meters. And obviously it would be much safer to leave your submarines at that depth and still be able to communicate with them by your command and control system than to have to do so just underneath the surface. R. Tucker Scully is head of the Polar Division at the Department of State. One claim which has been made about the U.S. scientific program is that one particular experiment at Seifel Station involving very low frequency radio waves was actually a military experiment in disguise. Are you aware of this? I've heard the charge. What's your reaction to it? Rubbish. And why do you say it's rubbish? Well, the charge is the, the charge basically has been that by learning, again, learning basic things about the geophysics of the planet, that knowledge can be applied to military purposes. Sure. But that was not the purpose of the experiment. That was not the way in which the experiment or any of our experiments in Antarctica have been undertaken. Our experiments have been de uh, have met and are conducted under an, a treaty that bans all military activities. There have been I've heard the same charge made about a number of experiments. But scientific research, knowledge generated by scientific research, can be applied in a variety of ways. And to say that knowledge generated by scientific activities can have a military application is true. But then to try to make some inference that, that if you're studying basic processes and trying to understand how the planet operates, you're engaged in some sort of uh, sub rosa military activity, it, it is, in my view, absolute hogwash. What is beyond dispute is the support given to the project by the United States Navy. An article published in the Journal of Geophysical Research shows that the original transmitter used for generating VLF signals was provided by the Office of Naval Research. And acknowledgments in scientific reports show that work was funded not only by the National Science Foundation but also by the Navy. In 1979, a second transmitter was installed called Jupiter, it was the most powerful transmitter in the world operating in the VLF range. Despite this capability, 
It was described in the National Science Foundation's Antarctic Journal as surface equipment on loan from the U.S. Navy. Any research that goes on on the ice in the name of the treaty, under the treaty, is essentially peaceful research, I think is the way it's put in the treaty. Uh, designing or attempting to design and develop a system for communication with strategic nuclear submarines hardly fits in that definition. Two years ago, the second Seipel station was closed. By that time, it was under 60 feet of ice and was being crushed. According to the National Science Foundation, a new station is being considered. Among the 10 other nations using military personnel in Antarctica is Argentina. Outwardly, her bases look peaceful enough. But this station, Lieutenant Jubany on King George Island, comes under the direct command of the Argentine Navy. Argentina's five other Antarctic bases are also run by the military. Esperanza and General Belgrano by the Army, Orcaras and General San Martín by the Navy, and Vice Commodore Marambio by the Air Force. The truth of the matter is that um, Argentina's Antarctic program is essentially a military program. It's run by military officers, and their Antarctic Institute is subordinate to the Ministry of Defense. And I think you could say that with the exception of the open presence of weapons, that uh, the Antarctic bases of Argentina really are military bases. Argentina did have one civilian base. Its name, Admiral Brown. Even here, there was a military commander. And since it was abandoned after a fire in 1984, only military bases remain. Even though they're not bases in the sense that you would walk up to them and find barbed wire and guns and so forth, uh, in many respects, they really are bases. And I would say that a good lawyer could make a case that they have, in fact, violated the treaty. Why have other countries let them get away with it without any complaint? I think other countries look upon some of these activities and see that if they were, in fact, to make a fuss over this and attempt to, to throw uh, Argentina out of the treaty or in some way to bring sanctions against them, I think the end result would be a destruction of the treaty system. And I think for this reason, they would prefer not to press, at least officially and, and formally, to press these issues very much. Just as there is reason to doubt that Antarctica is a continent of science, so there's also reason to doubt that it's a continent of peace. So what of the third Antarctic principle, that of international cooperation? One key stipulation of the treaty is that scientific observations and results shall be exchanged and made freely available, normally through scientific journals catalogued and held in libraries throughout the world. In theory, this prevents countries doing potentially valuable work such as prospecting and keeping the results to themselves, but not in practice. The type of work that I think is of concern to me and, and colleagues of mine uh, is work that involves primarily acquisition of marine geophysical data, specifically seismic uh, investigations. Dr. Anderson has named 13 countries which have carried out such seismic surveys around the Antarctic coast. Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Britain, France, Italy, Japan, Norway, New Zealand, Poland, the United States, the Soviet Union and West Germany. So which of these countries have published their results in full? The United States and Australia. And the rest? The rest have only published uh, pieces of data. Which, uh, which countries do you think are particularly at fault in this respect? Well, uh, I think that the, the countries that have utilized their national oil companies to acquire the data have been the ones that, that uh, have been slowest in publishing certainly all of their data, or even significant parts of their data. Uh, as it now stands, that would include uh, Japan, Brazil, and uh, France. Has Japan done any work which shows that there are, there is, for example, reason to believe that there is oil in Antarctica? We don't. We didn't find that. And our purpose is not to find some uh, mineral resources like oil. Actually, Japan has been involved in seismic exploration uh, in several areas in the Antarctic. Uh, 
in the Antarctic Peninsula region was one of their first seismic surveys. Uh, they've also been involved in seismic work in the Ross Sea region and uh, overall of the Amory Shell. How long ago was this work? Well, the work that was done in the peninsula was done approximately 10 years ago. And to my knowledge, uh, very little of that information was ever published. Another suggestion is that, that certain geological results have never been published by Japan. On that point, I'm not, uh, I don't know, but uh, for, if it is so, I think the study is not yet completed. So if science, peace and international cooperation stand exposed as the rhetoric of Antarctica, what is the reality? It is the last bit of ground on Earth that is not owned by anyone. And historically, people say to themselves that no bit of real estate has ultimately turned out to be useless. At the time you discover it, most people believe it is useless, and the same applied to the Antarctic. But this is the last chance, until we go to the moon, uh, to <coughs> say anything is your own and actually own a bit of new land. A definitive book on the geopolitics of Antarctica has been written by Deborah Shapley. They imagine that possibly one day something might be gotten out of this lump of rock. The Alaska analogy is often in people's minds when they think of Antarctica. There was Alaska, which seemed to be barren. Nobody cared about it. And then one day it turned out to have great riches. Though there's little reliable information about the true minerals potential of Antarctica, the very prospect has begun to dominate the political debate over its future. In 1988, after six years of negotiation, agreement was reached on a convention to allow limited prospecting and mining. Ironically designed as a way of shoring up the treaty, the minerals agreement has in fact provoked its biggest ever crisis. Last year, French Prime Minister Michel Rocard and Australian Prime Minister Bob Hawke announced they were pulling out of the agreement. Their stated reason? The environment. While environmentalists have claimed a victory, it would be naive to think that a new selfless age has dawned in the international politics of Antarctica. For one thing, there's the position of the French. Our policy is very simple. It is uh, to obtain a decision so that uh, the protection of Antarctica could be comprehensive, which would make Antarctica a nature reserve dedicated to science. In fact, environmental campaigners have for years been trying to stop the French building an airstrip at their one base in Antarctica, Dumont de Ville. The airstrip has involved the destruction of penguin colonies, reaching agreed measures on the protection of wildlife. Since France now suggests Antarctica should be a wilderness park, one would suppose that work on the airstrip would be halted. So what are your plans on the, on the airstrip, for example, now? We shall continue the airstrip. While other nations put the environmental stance of the French down to the power of the green vote in domestic politics, the effect has been to rock the consensus on which the Antarctic Treaty is built. And underlying that consensus is a deeply unstable position. Not only because the recent rash of interest has doubled the number of nations with a stake in Antarctica, but also fundamentally because of the issue of territorial claims. Prior to 1961, seven nations laid claim to parts of the continent. Britain, France, Norway, Australia, New Zealand, Argentina and Chile. The treaty froze all claims, yet these stamps show a pie-shaped slice of Antarctica as Argentinian territory. In fact, it's against the law in Argentina to publish maps which don't include the Antarctic sector. It's not the only way in which Argentina continues to assert its claim. The first human being in the history of the world to have been born in Antarctica in 1978 uh, was the son of an Argentine naval officer, the wife of an Argentine naval officer, who was brought down there pregnant uh, precisely for the purpose of having the first human being born. 
in Argentine Antarctica. This is an Argentine citizen, and that birth was duly recorded. Argentina has reportedly sent women to actually have babies uh, on the continent to uh, create uh, Antarctic citizens, as it were. What's the purpose of, of that? Well, those are not Antarctic citizens. They are Argentine citizens, because according to our legislation, uh, that is part of our national territory. So that is something that uh, shows how much we care about our territorial claim in Antarctica. And uh, the, f the first uh, baby born in Antarctica is an Argentine. And uh, we are proud of that fact. Chile uses similar tactics to support its claim. The presence of wives and children makes its Lieutenant Marsh base on King George Island look more like a colonial outpost than a scientific station. Other symbols of community life, a bank, a supermarket, and a souvenir shop, help reinforce the point. The territorial urge is not confined to Latin America. These British stamps are postmarked British Antarctic Territory. Perhaps it's just as well Britain's stamps don't include a map of the British Antarctic claim. It's the same area that Argentina claims. What's more, Chile claims part of it too. So what's the British position on Argentina's claim? Well, of course, we don't agree with it. Uh, but they don't agree with ours either. Neither do we agree with the Chileans. They don't agree with the Argentines or ours. Would Argentina be prepared to give up its claim? No, I think there's no possibility whatsoever of us giving a of our claim, we have uh, uh, enough uh, sound titles uh, for that claim, and we, uh, we plan to continue with our claim. And uh, uh, you know, our aspiration, as I said, is to have an international recognition of that claim. What is the, the UK's position on sovereignty now? We main, maintain and assert our sovereignty in Antarctica. Um, <clears throat> we we believe, strangely enough, that this is, offers another possibility. At the end of the day, if the treaty system were to collapse, is the result to be no law? Presumably, the result could be conflict. After all, one doesn't have to look far to find a parallel. The strength of the parallel is reinforced by the strange case of British Antarctic Survey spending in the 1980s. In the 70s, we had been on a, a declining base. For example, I lost 29% of my scientific staff in adjusting to uh, changes in our income. Uh, we were on the point of deciding we might have to close another base in 1982. We had taken the decision to close the base at South Georgia on uh, financial grounds. And we had negotiated with the governor of the Falkland Islands a contract to maintain a presence there, which came into force on the 1st of April. And of course, the war began a few days later. Following 82, the government took the decision to augment our budget by an extra five million a year. That extra five million pounds virtually doubled British spending in Antarctica in 1983. So why did it happen? I think that the extra funding was to enhance the British position um, in the South Atlantic and in the Antarctic. While the former claimant states pursued their own interests, the United States and the Soviet Union like to portray themselves as occupying the moral high ground, since neither has ever made a formal claim to territory. But the Russians are no less involved in the game on the ice than other nations. From his Molodezhnaya headquarters, nicknamed the Pentagon, Yuri Khabarov controls a network of eight bases which form a ring around Antarctica. According to Khabarov, their positions were decided by the need to take weather readings in different parts of the continent. But they also happened to give the Soviet Union a presence in sectors claimed by six out of the seven claimant nations, plus the one part of Antarctica not actually claimed by anyone at the time the treaty was negotiated in 1959. 
Molodezhnaya is itself in territory claimed by Australia, though the USSR has always refused to recognize this or any other claim. Not that the Russians are against claiming Antarctic territory in principle. In 1949, it asserted that it could claim all of Antarctica based on a circumnavigation by a, an admiral sailing in the service of the Tsar in the 1820s. And it, in 1950, said that it wanted to be counted in any international settlement dealing with Antarctica. And those statements in 1949 and 1950, in a sense, gave the clue to its strategy ever since, which has been it could assert the basis of a claim in a free-for-all to the whole continent, so it says. It tries to operate in Antarctica in a very uh, uh, impressive way. Again, it's a case of a logistics presence, just like the United States. It's an effort by, to have a logistics presence in order to exert influence. As befits the architect of the Antarctic Treaty, the public image of the United States is a model of internationalism. This Hercules is coming into McMurdo with a medical emergency, an officer from a British ship. To evacuate him, it's flown a round-trip distance of more than 3,500 miles, refueling at the South Pole on both legs of the journey. Within 10 minutes of landing, the evacuee is transferred to a Royal New Zealand Air Force plane which will fly him to Christchurch for hospital treatment. An impressive display of the ideals of the Antarctic Treaty, but is that really how we should interpret it? One reason that we send scientists deep into the mountains or we undertake spectacular rescue operations by air across continents is to show that we can get there, we know the logistics, we know the terrain, and that we can function in all parts of the continent. This is important geopolitically in case anyone were ever to make trouble. But it's also very important legally because under the law, uh, international tribunals have tended to recognize uh, claims based on the ability to administer. You have to show that you were there. But why is this important to the United States, which has never made a claim? If we were in a territorial free-for-all, the United States could argue that it saw and mapped more air part of the Antarctica's area than any other country has, including the Soviet Union. So that if it were ever a legal test, it could make a legal claim to much of the Antarctic continent, if not all of it. Are you, are you seriously suggesting that the United States has contemplated claiming the whole of Antarctica? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, it was a classified activity, but it persisted ever since the expeditions of Byrd in the late 20s. And with each expedition that went down there throughout the 30s and the 40s, and right up at least through 1956, to my knowledge, Americans in Antarctica, those deputized by the government, dropped claims markers, noting the location and the time and the date, and bringing a carbon copy back to Washington, which was held in, were held in secret files. Ever since 1956, South Pole Base has played a key role in US Antarctic policy. Six out of the seven other claims meet at this point. Every time an American plane moves around the taxiway, which not by accident encircles the geographical South Pole, it encroaches on each of those other territorial claims. So beneath the surface of Antarctic politics, the United States and the Soviet Union have both prepared positions from which they can claim much, if not all, of the continent. At the same time, nations which have claimed territory in the past are still pursuing those claims. So what's the potential for real conflict? Well, terrific. I mean, you're up to now nine, and uh, if a free-for-all were to start, what's to stop, you know, Uganda or the next guy from saying, oh, well, we'll come down and plant a flag. Here's our, here's our weather station. We'll plant a flag. 
With 25 players now involved in the game on the ice, that day may already have arrived. Later this year, the 25 will meet once more to try to resolve the minerals issue. If they fail, the possibility of conflict over the one significant piece of real estate on earth which nobody owns will move one step nearer. Most of us think it would be crazy to go to war over an ice-covered continent. But I accept the fact that any international solution is going to be continually difficult to run. But I think it's the only way in the long run we're going to avoid conflict. The only way. Whether that international solution can withstand the pressures of a resource-hungry world is about to be tested.